Welcome to ESPN Classic for Game 4 of one of the most dramatic championship series in recent history, the 86 American League Championship Series between the California Angels and the Boston Red Sox. I'm Carl Ravitch alongside Howard Reynolds, who was busy in 1986 solidifying the Mariner infield at second base. The Angels, the Red Sox, their playoff pass, uh, checkered at best, the Red Sox losing the World Series in 46 and then again in 67. And we know what happened in 78 with Bucky Dent. And then you look at the Angel Club and 1982, the ALCS against the Brewers, they go up to love, end up losing. Uh, something had to give. Somebody was going to win. And I, Carl, I know your heart is still aching <laughs> being that Red Sox fan, but eventually one of these clubs is going to finally get a chance to, to pour the champagne with victory. Look up the makeup of both these teams. Uh, the Red Sox pick up Don Baylor in the offseason. Mike Eastler goes. He was, of course, a fan favorite in Boston. And the Angels, uh, they didn't make a lot of changes. They've had guys who've been there for a while. Well, they, they really, 84 is when that ball club really started to, to jail and come together. I, I remember that was a strike year, mm -hmm. and they were all a lot of free agents, uh, veteran guys who really dug their heels in and really controlled even the union at that time. So they were a very cocky group, very confident in themselves and in their abilities, and felt like this was their time to win a world championship. Unlike the Red Sox, who have a very loyal fan following, out west, I mean, that's Dodger Town, no matter where you are on the West Coast, and you, and you know that as well as anybody. That's another thing that the Angels had to deal with. They were sort of an enigma when it came to baseball because of the Dodger success. Yeah, they really started to uh, bring a lot of fans in. Now, you had Rod Carew on that ball club. Wally, Wally World was right. the big thing. Everybody's coming out to see this phenomenal uh, Wally Joyner. And then you had Reggie Jackson. You had a lot of different players that had some flair. So it was exciting in Orange County as opposed to in L.A. You mentioned Wally World. They turned out to see him. He couldn't play. He had a leg infection, so George Hendrick moves from right field to first base. Let's join Al Michaels and Jim Palmer at Anaheim Stadium for Game 4 of the 86 ALCS between the Red Sox and the Angels. They play Box to hit to left in the outfield, but in the infield, Doug DeSensei gives him a lot of room, as you can see, off the line at third. Welcome back, everyone. It looks like Roger Clemens has returned to his Cy Young form after getting shelled in Game 1. And although he, Harold, got all the headlines, probably in 86 versus other pitchers, here's Don Sutton doing what Don Sutton does. Every time he goes out there, you know it's coming. It probably helps though, to have a guy like Bob Boone behind the plate, doesn't it? Well, it really does. Boone used to get into your head. You know, Sutton, like you said, you knew what he was throwing. He, the thing that was amazing about facing Don Sutton, when I got past the Oh, man, it's Don Sutton out <laughs> right. there. You, you get wrapped up in that, believe it or not. Uh, he didn't throw that hard, you know, and you expected, wow, this is the legendary Don Sutton. This ball's going to be 100 miles an hour. He'd sit back, and here it comes, 86, 87, 88, and then he'd throw all these different speeds on breaking pitches. And if you think about Bob Boone as a catcher, he always would change speeds with his pitchers. It seemed like every at-bat, you never got the same pitch that you got before. I, I remember standing in the batter's box, and I'd turn around, and I'd look at Boone, and He'd be looking at me, and he'd be checking out your feet, seeing if you're standing in the same place. And he's got you wondering, man, did I change my stance? <laughs> he would get into your head so much that you forgot who you were facing out there. And I think that's what Bob Boone brought the most to the ballpark. So you're thinking as much about Bob Boone as you are Don Sutton. Yeah, and you shouldn't be. Right. Now, when you face Roger Clemens, <laughs> what are you thinking about? Well, if, even if Boone was catching him, <laughs> you just better be thinking about Roger. Uh, at that time, this is before Roger started throwing that split finger fastball. He was strictly reach back, here comes my heat, right. and here comes a slider. But the difference with Roger Clemens and maybe Nolan Ryan or somebody like that, when they were power pitching at the, about the same age as Roger could put the ball where he wanted to. He'd bust you in or he'd put it away, and he would hit his target all the time. A lot of power pitchers, you don't know where it's going, but he had tremendous command. How difficult do you think it must have been for him uh, then because he was coming off, as we talked about, he got shells in game one, 143 pitches. I mean, everybody's arm has to get tired, and yet his reputation was tireless. Well, he's such a, a great worker, and he had tremendous endurance. Mm -hmm. I think that's why Roger Clemens has been so successful throughout his career is his in, in, ability to, to endure and to reach back and, and throw the little extra when you need to. And that's, that's not taught. And that's not even physical. It's more of a mental thing with Roger Clemens. So Roger Clemens and Don Sutton in the pitcher's duel. 28 runs have been given up in the first three games. 0-0 here. We'll see if the duel continues. 
when Game 4 of the 86 American League Championship Series returns in a moment here on ESPN Classic. Hi, I'm old school pitcher Bob Gibson. Two strikes and a ball. This is ESPN Classic. Welcome back. We're in Victory Yard. And the Angels' defense in the top of the eighth inning uh, was defenseless to stop anything. And part of the problem, of course, is Wally Joyner is hurt. George Hendrick is playing first. And uh, that changes the whole scope of things for a team that had been very, very good defensively during the year. Well, it really does. And here, here's how it changes. You take a first baseman like Wally Joyner, who had great range, right. left-handed, so he's going to have great range going to that right side with the left-hand glove that way. And Bobby Gritch now has to range a lot further. And you put more pressure on everybody throwing the ball to George over there at first base, who's not used to playing first base. Wild pitch by Vern Rule. The Cincinnati makes an error. Uh, is it contagious on a team? Obviously, you know, when you go to Little League games, you see one guy make an error and you see another, but this is the major leagues. Is it contagious still? It can be. Really? <laughs> that ball. And the other thing, the ball will find you. Right. You know, when you start losing a little confidence going, don't hit the ball at me, that's when it's hit to you. And so, yes, it still happens at the major league level. And even in that game, Bob Boone there with a pass ball. The Red Sox are only six outs from winning game four and tying this series at two wins apiece. They're up by three runs. Roger Clemens is in control. When we return to game four, the Angels hope their prayers will be answered. Welcome back to Victory Yard. I'm Carl Ravitch. Roger Clemens pitching for eight innings was absolutely outstanding. And then Calvin Chiraldi comes in. As far as the Angels look at this, victory? Well, you, you get Clemens out of the game. All of a sudden you go, all right, right, we got a chance to score some runs now. And it wouldn't have mattered if Goose Gossage was coming out of the bullpen. Uh, whoever was the premier closer at that time, it was always better to face him than facing Roger Clemens. As far as the Red Sox go, one of the problems they had throughout this year had been their bullpen. They never really had an established closer until I think it was August where Chiraldi was, was established as the closer. And, and obviously in postseason play, you need a dependable bullpen. They didn't have it. Well, anytime you played the Red Sox, you always, your game plan was let's get into that pin. Right. And if you got into the bullpen, you felt like you had a chance to win. And not just from against Clemens or anybody, but you wanted to get in that pin, your confidence rows and your opportunities were a lot greater because they did not have a very solid bullpen. Chiraldi comes in, he gets a ball misplayed by Jim Rice and left off of Pettis, and then he hits Brian Downing and says it was the stupidest pitch he'd ever thrown of his entire life because he was trying to make the perfect pitch. Well, that, that's what happens. You try to do something that's not within your characteristics. The, the players that are successful in the playoffs do what they did during the regular season. You know, Chiraldi tried to throw a backdoor slider to Brian Downing not a pitch that he's thrown all year. He would go after a guy and challenge him and say, hit this fastball. So when you're taken out of your game, you're put not only in unfamiliar territory being in the playoffs, right. but now you're throwing pitches that you don't normally throw. And that's just a sign of inexperience. Red Sox down in the series. Clemens now on the bench. When we come back to game four of the 86 ALCS, Marty Barrett, Bill Buckner, and Jim Rice take their cuts in the top of the 10th inning as Boston looks to regain the lead without their ace. So here are the Angels. Everything looks, all systems go. We're going to get to the World Series. They win game four. They get a great pitching performance out of the bullpen from Doug Corbett and Bobby Gritch. You know, we talked about the veteran leadership on this team finally comes through with a clutch hit. Yeah, it looks like all things are starting to click for him. Doug Corbett, there's a guy who, who would throw this nice little sinker, gets a lot of ground balls, and uh, stayed within his game. That, that's what stands out in my mind about him is this guy never tried to overpower anybody he knew what kind of stuff he had and then bobby gritch trying to decide if he was going to retire right. or not so you know he's giving it his last best effort so the big base hit finally all systems ended up of course not being go game five you know the two images that people have dave henderson's home run and donnie moore walking off the mound yeah and that's that's so tragic i i remember uh hindu hitting the homer Spinning around, right. that's the visual yeah. image that I have of Dave Henderson. And then Donnie Moore, I just remember the following year going to spring training and, and the Angels used to train in Palm Springs. He was getting booed in spring training when he'd come out to get his work and then to start the season, uh, we opened up with the Angels all the time playing out on the West Coast and we'd play in Anaheim and, and he came out of the pen the first series there constantly getting booed. It, it just weighed such a heavy burden on him that he was never able to 
overcome that and eventually end up committing suicide. Could you see that? I mean, uh, I don't know if you could see it in spring training, but could you see it as a player, how this would take such an immense emotional toll on you? Could you see it affecting him at all or no? I did, I did not see it in him. You know, I thought he'd be able to battle through that, Jim, similar to Bill Buckner booting the ball. He was able to battle through that. Second time in five years now, the Angels one step away from getting there, and they failed. Gene Mock had been close before and was unable to do it again. At this point, I mean, is it a cursed organization, or is it just, just the way things are going? I, I think it's just the way things are going. You know, and I think a lot of it had to do with the style of ball that they played, too. They were a very one-dimensional team, uh, very conservative. They'd get a runner on first base, first inning, they're butting the runner to second base because Gene Mock's philosophy was, I want to get that one run. And it seemed like they played a very conservative type of game. When you play that type of conservative game, when the other team starts to push, you kind of start to gasp for air because you played such a conservative style. You don't have an explosive, we're going to go get them, even though they had players that had that type of ability. Red Sox come back here, perhaps use a little too much. They end up losing the World Series in 86 to the New York Mets. Thanks for watching Game 4, the 1986 ALCS. ESPN Classic will return in a moment.